Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to be reading Week 1, Day 2 of Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. Today we're going to be reading Chapters 3 and 4. Let's look at our vocabulary words for today. Our first word is comfort. Let's look at the word comfort. I hear two syllables there. Comfort can be a noun or a verb and means to give relief or make more pleasant. You can comfort someone who is sad by hugging her. The verb suffixes are added without spelling change. The adjective form is comforted. Let's take a look at the breaks in the word comfort. I see an O, another O are my vowels. Let's think about where the break is. If you thought between the M and the F, you're correct. Let's look at the first syllable. What kind of syllable is that? Closed. This is a closed syllable because the O does not say its name. Fort, fort. What kind of syllable do you think that is? Let's take a look. This one is R controlled. We hear that or sound at the end of comfort. Let's look at our next word. Our next word is defend. Defend is a verb that means to protect from harm. You should defend a friend if people are telling lies about him. Verb suffixes are added without spelling change. Defended, defending. Defense is the noun form. Defensive is the adjective form. Let's look at the breaks in the word defend. I see an E and another E. Let's see where our break is. If you thought between the E and the F, you're correct. D, D, let's see what kind of syllable that is. It's open, you hear that E sound. Fend, fend. Let's see what kind of syllable that is. Closed D. And there we have our second word, defend. Let's do some reading for today. Our first focus, as you listen, Sal goes to school. How do you think she's feeling about the whole move? Today we'll be reading chapters three and four. Really focus in on Sal's feelings. Chapter three. Bravery. Because I first saw Phoebe on the day my father and I moved to Euclid, I began my story of Phoebe with the visit to the red-headed Margaret Cadavers, where I also met Mrs. Partridge, her elderly mother. Margaret nearly fell over herself being nice to me. What lovely hair, she said, and aren't you sweet? I was not sweet that day. I was being particularly ornery. I wouldn't sit down, and I wouldn't look at Margaret. As we were leaving, Margaret whispered to my father, John, have you told her yet how we met? My father looked uncomfortable. No, he said. I tried, but she doesn't want to know. Now that was the truth. Absolutely. Who cares, I thought. Who cares how he met Margaret? Cadaver. When at last we left Mrs. Cadaver and Mrs. Partridge, we drove for approximately three minutes. Two blocks from Margaret's Cadaver's was the place where my father and I were now going to live. Tiny squat trees, little bird houses in a row, and one of those bird houses was ours. No swimming hole, no barn, no cows, no chickens, no pigs. 
Instead, a little white house with a miniature patch of green grass in front of it. It wasn't enough grass to keep a cow alive for five minutes. Let's take a tour, my father said, rather too heartily. We walked through the tiny living room into the miniature kitchen, upstairs into my father's pint-sized bedroom, and on into my pocket-sized bedroom, and into the wee bathroom. I looked out the upstairs window, down into the backyard. Half of the tiny yard was a cement patio, and the other half was another patch of grass that was imaginary cow would devour in two bites. There was a tall wooden fence all around the yard, and to the left and right of our yard were other identical fence plots. After the moving van arrived and two men crammed our by banks furniture into our birdhouse, my father and I inched into the living room, crawling over sofas and chairs and tables, and boxes, boxes, boxes. Hmm, my father said. It looks as if we tried to squeeze all the animals into the chicken coop. Three days later, I started school and saw Phoebe again. She was in my class. Most of the kids in my new school spoke in quick, sharp bursts and dressed in stiff new clothes and wore braces on their teeth. Most girls wore their hair in exactly the same way, in a shoulder-length bob. That's what they called it with long bangs that they repeatedly shook out of their eyes. We once had a horse who did that. Everyone kept touching my hair. Don't you ever cut it, they said. Can you sit on it? How do you wash it? Is it naturally black like that? Do you use conditioner? I couldn't tell if they liked my hair or if they thought I looked like a wang doodle. I gotta stop right there for a minute. Cause I need to self-monitor here. I don't know what a wang doodle is. So I'm going to reread the paragraph and see if I can make it make sense. I think it must mean something bad, but I need to know exactly what it is. I have to infer the meaning based on the information around it. So let's look at wang doodle one more time. Do you use conditioner? I couldn't tell if they liked my hair or if they thought I looked like a wang doodle. I'm thinking that wang doodle means that she looks strange or out of the ordinary. One girl, Mary Lou Finney, said the most peculiar things. Like, out of the blue sky, she would say, omnipotent and beef brain. I couldn't make any sense of it. There were Megan and Christy, who jumped up and down like parched peas, Moody Beth Ann, and pink-cheeked Alex. There was Ben, who drew cartoons all day long, and a peculiar English teacher named Mr. Berkway. And then there was Phoebe Winterbottom. Ben called her Freebie Icebottom and drew a picture of a bumblebee with an ice cube on its bottom. Phoebe tore it up. Phoebe was a quiet girl who stayed mostly by herself. She had a pleasant round face and huge, enormous sky blue eyes. Around this pleasant round face, her hair, as yellow as a crow's foot, curled in short ringlets. During the first week, when my father and I were at Margaret's, we ate dinner there three times that week. I saw Phoebe's face twice more at her window. Once I waved at her, but she didn't seem to notice. And at school, she never mentioned that she had seen me. Then one day at lunch, she slid into the seat next to me and said, Sal, you're so courageous. You're ever so brave. To tell you the truth, I was surprised. You could have knocked me over with a chicken feather. Me? I'm not brave, I said. You are. You are brave. I was not. I, Salamanca Tree Hiddle, was afraid of lots and lots of things. For example, I was terrified of car accidents, death, cancer, brain tumors, nuclear war, pregnant women, loud noises, strict teachers, elevators, and scads of other things, that I was not afraid of spiders, snakes, and wasps. 
Phoebe had nearly everyone else in my new class did not have much fondness for these creatures. But on that day, when a dignified black spider was investigating my desk, I cupped my hands around it, carried it to the open window, and set it outside on the ledge. Mary Lou Finney said, Alpha and Omega, will you look at that? Beth Ann was as white as milk. All around the room, people were acting as if I had single-handedly taken on a fire-breathing dragon. What I have since realized is that if people expect you to be brave, sometimes you pretend that you are, even when you are frightened down to your very bones. But this was later, during the whole thing with Phoebe's lunatic, that I realized this. At this point in my story, Graham interrupted me to say, Why, Salamanca, of course you're brave. All the Hiddles are brave. It's a family trait. Look at your daddy, your mama. Mama's not a real Hiddle, I said. She practically is, Graham said. You can be married to a Hiddle that long and not become a Hiddle. That is not what my mother used to say. She would tell my father, You Hiddles are a mystery to me. I'll never be a true Hiddle. She did not say this proudly. She said it as if she were sorry about it, as if it was some sort of failing in her. My mother's parents, my other set of grandparents, are Pickfords, and they are un as unlike my grandparents' Hiddle as a donkey is unlike a pickle. Grandmother and Grandfather Pickford stand straight up, as if sturdy steel poles run down their backs. They wear starched iron clothing, and when they are shocked or surprised, which is often, they say, Really? Is that so? And their eyes open wide, and their mouths turn down at the corners. Once I asked my mother why Grandmother and Grandfather Pickford never laughed. My mother said, you're just so busy being respectable. It takes a lot of concentration to be that respectable. And then my mother laughed and laughed in a gentle way, and you could tell her own spine was not made of steel because she bent in half, laughing and laughing. My mother said that Grandmother Pickford's one act of defiance in her whole life as a Pickford was in naming her. Grandmother Pickford whose own name is Gayfeather, named after my mother, Shinhassan. It's an Indian name, meaning tree sweet juice, or, in other words, maple sugar. Only Grandmother Pickford ever called my mother by her Indian name, though. Everyone else called my mother Sugar. Most of the time, my mother seemed nothing like her parents at all. And it was hard for me to imagine that she had come from them. But occasionally, in small, unexpected moments, the corners of my mother's mouth would turn down, and she'd say, Really? Is that so? And sound exactly like a Pickford. Chapter 4 That's what I'm telling you. On the day that Phoebe sat next to me at lunch and told me I was brave, she invited me to her house for dinner. To be honest, I was, I was relieved that I would not have to eat at Margaret's again. I did not want to see Dad and Margaret smiling at each other. I wanted everything to be like it was. I wanted to be back in Bybanks, Kentucky, in the hills and trees, near the cows and chickens and pigs. I wanted to run down the hill from the barn and through the kitchen door that banged behind me and see my mother and my father sitting at the table peeling apples. Phoebe and I walked home from school together. We stopped briefly at my house so that I could call my father at work. Margaret had helped him find a job selling farm machinery. He said it made him happy as a clam at high water to know I had a new friend. Maybe this is really why he was happy, I thought, or maybe it was because he could be alone with Margaret Cadaver. Phoebe and I then walked to our house. As we passed Margaret Cadaver's house, a voice called out, Sal, Sal, is that you? In the shadows on the porch, 
Margaret's mother, Mrs. Partridge, sat in a wicker rocker, a thick, gnarled cane with a handle carved in the shape of a cobra's head lay across her knees. Her purple dress had slipped up over her bony knees, which were spread apart, and I hate to say it, but you could see right up her skirt. Around her neck was a yellow feather scarf. My boa, she once told me. My most favorite boa. As I started up the walk, Phoebe pulled on my arm. Don't go up there, she said. It's only Mrs. Partridge, I said. Come on. Who's that with you? Mrs. Partridge said. What's that on her face? I knew what she was going to do. She did this with me the first time I met her. Phoebe placed her hands on her own round face and felt around. Come here, Mrs. Partridge said. She wriggled her crooked little fingers at Phoebe. Mrs. Partridge put her fingers up to Phoebe's face and mashed around gently over her eyelids and down her cheeks. Just as I thought, it's two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Mrs. Partridge laughed, a wicked laugh that sounded as if it were bouncing off jagged rocks. You're 13 years old. Yes, Phoebe said. I knew it, Mrs. Partridge said. I just knew it. She patted her yellow feather boa. This is Phoebe Winterbottom, I said. She lives right next door to me. When we left, Phoebe whispered, I wish you hadn't done that. I wish you hadn't told her I live next door. Why not? You don't seem to know Mrs. Cadaver and Mrs. Partridge very well. They haven't lived there very long, only a month or so. Don't you think it's remarkable that she guessed your age? I don't see what is so remarkable about it. Before I could explain, Phoebe started telling me about the time that she and her mother, father, and sister Prudence had gone to the state fair. At one booth, a crowd was gathered and a tall, thin man. So what was he doing, I asked. That's what I'm telling you, Phoebe said. Phoebe had a way of sounding like grown-up sometime. When she said, that's what I'm telling you, she sounded like a grown-up talking to a child. What he was doing was guessing people's ages. All around, people were saying, oh, and amazing, and how does he do that? He had to guess your, your correct age without within one year or else you want a teddy bear. How did he do it? I asked. That's what I'm telling you, Phoebe said. The thin man would look someone over carefully, close his eyes, and then he would point his finger at the person and shout, 72! At everyone? He guessed everyone to be 72? Sal, she said. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I was just giving you an example. He might have said 10 or 30 or 72. It just depends on the person. He was astounding. I really thought it was more astounding that Mrs. Partridge could do this, but I didn't say anything. Phoebe's father wanted that thin man to guess his age. My father thinks he looks very young, and he was certain he could fool the man. After staying, studying my father, the thin man closed his eyes, pointed his finger at my father, and shouted, 52! My father gave a little yelp, and all around people were automatically saying, Oh, and amazing, and all that. But my father stomped them. Why? Phoebe pulled on one of her yellow curls. I think she wished she hadn't started this story in the first place. Because he wasn't anywhere near 52. He was only 38. Oh. And all day long, my father followed us through the fair, carrying his prize, a large green teddy bear. He was miserable. He kept saying, 52? 52? Do I look 52? Does he? I said. Phoebe pulled harder on her hair. No, he doesn't. He look 52. He looks 38. She was very defensive about her father. Phoebe's mother was in the kitchen. I'm making blackberry pie, 
Mrs. Winterbottom said. I hope you like blackberries. Is there something wrong? Really, if you don't like blackberries, I could... No, I said. I like blackberries very much. I just have some allergies, I think. To blackberries? Mrs. Winterbottom said. No, not to blackberries. The truth is, I do not have allergies, but I could not admit that blackberries reminded me of my mother. Mrs. Winterbottom made me and Phoebe sit down at the kitchen table and tell her about our day. Phoebe told her about Mrs. Partridge guessing her age. She's really remarkable, I said. Phoebe said, it's not that remarkable, Sal. I won't exactly use the word remarkable. But Phoebe, I said, Mrs. Partridge is blind. Both Phoebe and her mother said, blind? Later, Phoebe said to me, don't you think it's odd that Mrs. Partridge, who is blind, could see something about me, but I, who can see, was blind about her? And speaking of odd, there's something very odd about Mrs. Cadaver. Margaret, I said. She scares me half to death, Phoebe said. Why? That's what I'm telling you, she said. First, there's that name, Cadaver. You know what cadaver means? Actually, I did not. It means dead body. Are you sure, I said? Of course I'm sure, Sal. You can check the dictionary if you want. Do you know what she does for a living? What her job is? Yes, I was pleased to say I was pleased to know something. She's a nurse. Exactly, Phoebe said. Would you want a nurse whose name meant dead body? And that hair. Don't you think all that sticking out red hair is spooky? And that voice. It reminds me of dead leaves all blowing around on the ground. This was Phoebe's power. In her world, no one was ordinary. People, people were either perfect, like her father, or, more often, they were lunatics or axe murderers. She could convince me of just about anything especially about Margaret Cadaver. From that day on, Margaret Cadaver's hair did look spooky, and her voice did sound exactly like dead leaves. Somehow, it was easier to deal with Margaret if there were reasons not to like her, and I definitely did not want to like her. Do you want to know an absolute secret? Phoebe said, I did. Promise not to tell? I promised. Maybe I shouldn't, she said. Your father goes over there all the time. He likes her, doesn't he? She twirled her fingers through her curly hair and let those big blue eyes roam over the ceiling. Her name is Mrs. Cadaver, right? Have you ever wondered what happened to Mr. Cadaver? I never really thought about. Well, I think I know, Phoebe said. And it is awful. Purely awful. That ends our selection for today. I'll see you soon to discuss this one. See you at 920.